Okay. Um, a bit of a breather on the homework. It probably never seemed possible when you're submitting some assignments every single class period at the beginning of the semester, but now uh, your next assignment isn't going to be due until the 21st of October. So you've got more than a week to submit the next assignment, the hydrographs assignment I'll give you in class on Tuesday of next week. Also, if you look at the uh, class schedule that I gave you at the beginning of the semester, it shows that exam number two is going to be on uh, October 21st. That's also a Tuesday. So we'll only have two midterms. This will be the second of the midterms, and then, of course, there's also a final exam. Um, today we're going to talk about just some of the basic information that you need before we begin modeling runoff. And modeling runoff is... Um, did you already submit that file? Oh, okay. um, modeling runoff is important because it's, you know, the answer that the hydrology uh, analysis is going to be using for the hydraulic engineer. And um, I already showed you this big formula here when I was talking about a project I did for the um, Division of Environmental Protection here in West Virginia. And what this big equation says, it's just a conceptual model that says how much water is coming out of a watershed depends on the amount of water that's coming in to a watershed because this is a way of looking at um, mass balance. So, uh, well, actually, let me represent it a little bit differently. If we look at a watershed from above, all right. There's going to be a series of rivers going through the watershed. <coughs> what we want to be able to tell the uh, hydraulic designer is the flow rate that's coming out of our watershed. What this model says is how much comes out depends on, first of all, if you have a river coming in. And so Q in is referring to stream flow from outside the watershed boundaries of our interest. Precipitation, we've talked about different ways of uh, finding precipitation data online. There's the precipitation frequency data server. You can use the uh, graphical maps that are associated with Hydro 35 and extrapolate based on those. You can set a rain gauge out in the field. Um, so precipitation is the, uh, the amount of moisture that's falling onto the surface of the land. Evapotranspiration is the liquid water that's escaping out of the watershed. And it's not only from the surface of water itself, but it is also the uh, exhalation of plants. And so some of the water that's under the ground surface is brought up by plant roots and exhaled, in, uh, exhaled into the atmosphere, and that's ET, evapotranspiration. GR, groundwater recharge, is infiltration. And so it, whatever infiltrates isn't going to be available for runoff. And so if we show it like here's the underground environment, the water that goes off of the surface and recharges the aquifer, GR is groundwater recharge. Yeah? How can that be plus or minus? Because sometimes water will seep in an artesian well. And um, there are some places, I don't know, have you ever been out to Barbersville Park before? No. There's this, in Barbersville, they've got a big park and there's a hillside that's just perennially wet. If you walk along the hillside up by the tennis courts, it's just soggy all the time, even when it hasn't been raining. And it's because um, the water comes out of the ground and onto the surface from there. So it's a good question. Why would groundwater recharge be plus or minus? Oftentimes, most of the time, infiltration from a storm is going to go down into the soil, but sometimes um, it comes back out of the soil. And I have a couple of slides today that shows um, the base flow that can come out of the groundwater and into streams. Like yeah, that's right. Surface water recharge is if there is a, uh, a lake inside of our watershed. So here's uh, surface water, it's a lake. 
the lake level can rise and fall depending on if it's been dry, if it's been wet. And so in any particular 24-hour storm event, the amount of water that we have coming out of the watershed may depend on whether the pond levels are rising or falling, how much water is being used by large quantity users inside of a watershed. That could be a town that is taking water out of the, uh, uh, out of the stream and, and uh, converting that into drinking water. It could be a factory that is using river water for cooling. And of course, when, when water is put through a cooling tower, it evaporates and you see the big white plumes. It looks like smoke, but really it's just water vapor in a cooling tower at power plants. And so a lot of water is consumed and it's not going to run off all of that water that's used for industrial and um, domestic water production. And then there's also agricultural uses. So watering crops where the water becomes essentially embodied in the crop. And that idea that a kilogram of rice requires 1,000 kilograms of water over the course of it being grown and produced um, and so all of the water that is taken from the crops and, you know, where does that water go? It doesn't go into the, the rice itself because, you know, the rice grains are very dry when you buy them in the store. But the water that's embodied in that, in its production, has been sucked up by the plant and evaporated to the atmosphere. And so it's just another way of accounting for evapotranspiration. But it's not all evapotranspiration because, of course, there's livestock uses of water as well. So. What we're doing in uh, modeling is trying to find out different ways to estimate these quantities. Where we're going in the course is a variety of different methods that try and predict what the Q out is going to be. The very first place that we started with that is the rational method. You remember the very simple formula Q equals CIA. Well, this formula, trying to tell you the runoff flow rate, is a very crude and approximate way of trying to keep track of all of these things. And Q equals CIA actually does account for all of these things. Um, I, of course, that's the, uh, the rate of um, precipitation. And so the precipitation, you'll know, here's, here's the precipitation term. In a rainstorm, we assume that there isn't going to be any evapotranspiration, and so it neglects ET. GR, the amount of groundwater recharge, is built into our estimate of C value. C value is the ratio of runoff to precipitation. And so uh, 1 minus the C value tells you how much water gets down into the soil. And so it's an indirect way of accounting for groundwater recharge. In Q equals CIA, we assume that there's no change in surface water storage, that this is a a small watershed that doesn't have um, a pond in it. And it also neglects any sort of water use from large quantity users or agricultural use. And it assumes that there's no flow coming in to the small watershed. And so the rational method is one way to estimate where is the water coming from, where is it going, and how much is there of that. We can do better than the, than the rational method, though. We're going to look at more sophisticated and realistic ways of trying to model this. And um, so we're going to talk about a few more pieces of the puzzle, different effects that these models try and take into account. And uh, anything that comes between rainfall and runoff is considered an abstraction. We've got rainfall, which causes runoff. And we have different names for the same thing. Sometimes we call it precipitation because um, rainfall is just one type of precipitation. There's, of course, snow, fog, sleet, hail. Rainfall is probably the most common as far as the precipitation that causes appreciable runoff in the short term. And sometimes, instead of calling it runoff, we call it uh, rainfall excess. And this is a really important term. And the excess means something specific. It means the rainfall over and above any abstractions that there were. Abstractions are things that uh, just get in the way of uh, 
rainfall excess. It's the difference between the observed precipitation and the rainfall excess. And so one type of abstraction that I've mentioned to you before is surface wetting. And here are a couple of pictures that show different types of surface wetting. You know, here on the bottom you can see a really rough asphalt pavement. And above that, the uh, picture is showing um, tiles of polished granite. And so each one of these are going to have different requirements in terms of how much water is required to wet the surface before there's any runoff. Uh, asphalt, since it's bumpy and has little pores in it and has a higher specific surface area than the uh, polished granite, is going to require more precipitation before there's any excess. And so we'd say that this has a greater abstraction than the image on top. Um, more generally, we can, we can think of abstractions as just um, anything that changes the quantity or even the timing of rainfall. It may be that you get the same amount of rainfall coming off of the surface, like this uh, this polished surface, but it may delay the amount, the, how quickly it arrives at the destination. So it's the delay and routing effect, the reduction in the amount. And so the implications of abstraction, the, right, the reason why we care is because it's going to change the flow, the Q, the peak flow that sizes culverts downstream and bridges and the depth of water going through a channel. Um, the amount of abstraction will adjust the pond requirements if we're trying to reduce the peak runoff. We have to understand the abstractions to be able to predict accurately what the inflow hydrograph is going to look like. Um, sizing of channels, treatment process if you're trying to improve the quality of the rainwater because uh, runoff often carries with it a lot of grit. It can have oils because, you know, vehicles that are driving over the roadway are leaking oil and the gasoline will drip from the car and grease comes off of the axles and so roads are dirty and when it rains a lot of that grease and grit and salt when it's snowy and they've put down salt to try and melt the ice all of that stuff gets into the river and so sometimes we try and clean up the water a bit before it reaches uh, its ultimate destination and so treatment process parameters are affected by abstractions as well so one of the abstractions we haven't talked about so far is called interception. And you hear that word a lot in football. The idea of interception is uh, grabbing something before it arrives at its intended destination. In the case of rainfall and runoff, what interception is is plants, vegetation, or buildings even, that um, shield the rainfall from reaching the ground. And so it may be that it actually takes the water out and is going to reduce how much water gets to the ground, or it may just be a delay effect. So you'll, you'll notice on this uh, picture here, you can see a big drop of water on a leaf. And it looks like if there's any more water, then it's gonna, that leaf is going to spill. And then that raindrop would go either to the ground or to the next leaf under it. But what it's done is it's delayed the water. Because if this plant wasn't in the way, then the rainfall would have gone directly to the ground and would have immediately started the process of either infiltration or runoff. But because this plant's in the way, it slowed down how quickly the precipitation goes from the sky to the ground. And so interception is very important, both from the quantity reduction and from the delay. And any kind of delay is going to reduce the peak runoff because, remember, time of concentration, as the time of concentration increases, then you use a lower rainfall intensity off of an IDF curve. You created IDF curves in one of your homework assignments earlier in the semester. And what you'll remember about the shape of an IDF curve is, you know, they can be constructed a lot of different ways, but if here's the two-year storm, and here's a five-year storm, here's a ten-year storm, uh, this would be storm duration. So it would be like five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes. And then this is the uh, rainfall intensity. And that might be units of inches per hour, 
and storm duration units of minutes. So the reason I bring it up is if the rain falls directly from the sky to the ground and then starts moving its way towards the outlet, you have to calculate the time of concentration and it's the time of concentration you use as the storm duration to find out what is the rainfall intensity. So over there in the rational method, which rainfall intensity I to use to try and predict the runoff depends on how long it takes the water to travel from the sky towards the outlet, towards the, the ultimate, um, if here's our conceptual watershed, the time of concentration is how long does it take, you know, what I said before is how long does it take to go from this boundary, it flows over the surface, then it gets into the channel, it's flowing through the channel, and now it finally arrives here at the outlet. If we have a stopwatch and we click the amount of time it takes to get from the furthest point in the watershed until it gets to the outlet, that's what we use as the time of concentration and the storm duration off of the IDF curve. What I'm telling you now is actually it's not when the raindrop hits the ground, it's actually when does the raindrop fall from the sky and be intercepted by a tree and how does the, uh, the plant and vegetation that's between the surface and the, the cloud in the sky have an effect on the, uh, the time of concentration. So heavier vegetation is going to intercept more water and so it'll reduce the intensity and it also increase the time of concentration. So that's one of the concepts I hope that you'd be able to explain on an exam or in a quiz is um, not just how interception reduces the amount, but why the delay is important. Because the longer the delay, the lower the intensity that comes off of an IDF curve. Here's a table that shows some, uh, some measured values of interception. And one of the things you'll know is that different plants have different levels of interception. So let's look at a, a pine tree and compare that to a hardwood like, I don't know the Latin for any of these hardwoods. I don't know what, uh, <laughs> Carpius SP. Um, in general, pine trees, for example, have lower interception because the leaf area is smaller than some of the deciduous hardwoods. The leaf area is bigger. Um, grasses have a relatively low percent interception and that's not because there isn't a lot of area for grass but it's because it's already low to the ground and the, uh, um, there isn't a really uh, high overlapping branches. Like uh, some of the trees that are really tall, the water will fall onto a leaf and then fall onto another leaf and sort of have to cascade through the canopy, but if a, a, a tree is relatively short, the interception is going to be much lower. So the way that you would use this is you would um, take into account the storm characteristics and the local climate, the density of the vegetation, and there's also seasonal variations is another thing to point out is that uh, during the summer versus the winter, if you look at some of these hardwoods, in the summer this tree is more effective at intercepting than it is in the winter because in the winter it's just the branches and there's a much lower um, probability that a rainfall is going to hit a branch on its way down to the ground then if it's fully leafed out tree then there's a lot more leaves as you look down from above. Um, the health of the plants, the age, their size, all that comes into account and uh, this is the formula that we use for calculating interception and uh, it's a process that takes into account the leaf area index K that's provided uh, in the problem statement. The interception percentage that's given here is only one of the factors. The leaf area index is sort of a way of thinking about it is how many layers of um, how many layers of vegetation are there from the top to the bottom of the vegetated canopy where you know a, a very tall oak tree would maybe have a high leaf area index and grasses would have a low leaf area index because grass isn't very tall. Um, 
So let's just get some experience practicing these interception calculations here. Um, here's a table that classifies a typical amount of storage that can be counted on for different types of vegetation. And uh, that's the storage S that we're going to use in the formula for interception. All right. So here we have a storm that's uh, 1.5 hours long. The precipitation amount is 35 millimeters. Um, we have some evaporation that's occurring during the storm. 0.3 millimeters per hour. And we've got spruce trees with a leaf area index of 6.5. So uh, the time is 1.5 hours. Precipitation, 38 millimeters. Evaporation is 0.3 millimeters. And the leaf area index, 6.5. Okay, the general formula that we're going to use, interception is storage 1 minus E to the negative P divided by S plus K E T. Okay. Um, since this is a spruce, spruce uh, tree, we're going to use a storage depth of 7 millimeters. Um, that means that looking down from above, a total depth of 7 millimeters of precipitation is required to wet all of the surface of the spruce tree before precipitation begins to make it down to the ground. And so uh, we've got the 7 millimeters, 1 minus E to the negative 38 divided by 7. P is the precipitation depth. 7 was our storage, plus K, 6.5, the leaf area index, evaporation, 0.3 millimeters, and 1.5 hours. The reason why we multiply the evaporation depth by the leaf area index is it's like saying that there are 6.5 layers of um, leaf area that this evaporation is occurring over. And so it's not just one surface. You know, when we have a single ground surface, the evaporation is just the, uh, the evaporation depth over that one surface. But here with a tree, if I was going to represent this conceptually, it's sort of like there's different layers of the tree. And the evaporation is occurring on each one of these layers. There's one, two, three, all the way up to 6.5 on average, 6.5 layers of the tree. So evaporation is going to be occurring on each one of them. Um, this quantity says that there's going to be 6.969 millimeters of storage. And then the other part of the abstraction is how much evaporation is there going to be off of the surface of the plant. And there's 2.925 millimeters of evaporation during the storm period. And so the, uh, the total amount, the infiltration is going to be 9.89 millimeters. Oh, not infiltration, interception. Sorry. Let me write that out. Interception. So interception is 9.89 millimeters. And that means that uh, the amount of moisture available for runoff and infiltration together is going to be 28.11 millimeters. So that's how much of the original 38 millimeters of precipitation is available for runoff and infiltration. So this is kind of an extreme example. This is at the far end of what we could maybe expect from interception. But it's not limited to vegetation. Buildings can intercept rainfall. And on a windy day, maybe you've stood on one side of a building to try and avoid from keeping wet. <clears throat> it's just saying that if you had 38 millimeters of rain 
and 9.89 of it is intercepted, what's left over is 28.11. It's, it's the leftover amount that isn't intercepted. Another abstraction is depression storage. Uh, before water is going to run off, it's going to fill small holes and puddles and accumulate in the surface depression. Um, this isn't ever going to drain over the surface. This is just a, a puddle that's going to fill up before there's any runoff over this surface. Um, it will either evaporate or infiltrate, but it's kind of like a dead-end pond that has to be filled, and so it can be considered another abstraction. Um, runways are a place where there's quite a bit of um, surface wetting before there's going to be any runoff, and actually in airport design, they're very careful to try and balance the slope of the runway to make it flat enough that it isn't difficult for airplanes to maintain stability as they're landing. But at the same time, they also have to be sloped because if they're not sloped, then you're going to have a thick film of water over the surface and then that would cause hydroplaning and um, not enough friction to control the aircraft as it's landing. And so. Um, the FAA actually has a method of estimating how quickly water moves over paved surfaces. They've gone above and beyond the uh, time of concentration methods that we've looked at before and trying to look at how quickly water moves over the surface and therefore what the delay is as precipitation hits a paved surface and starts making its shallow um, concentrated travel towards the grass that's on the side of the runway. Um, in our text, it has a few typical values of how much storage you can count on for different types of surfaces. And so these are all abstractions that's going to reduce how much of the precipitation is available for runoff. And it says, as you'd expect, that a flat pavement is going to store more moisture than a steep pavement. You know, if it's steep, then gravity is more effective at draining the water and pulling it off of the surface and reducing the thickness or the depth of water that's accumulating on a paved surface. And the more irregular the surface is and the greater its uh, surface area, like forest litter here, forest litter means there's a lot of leaves and branches and acorns and dirt, just all of the things that you'd expect in a forest. All of those things have to become wet and have their surface coated before the precipitation there's been so much precipitation that then uh, there's an excess and the flow starts to move downstream. So slope, you can see, is one of the factors that affects abstraction. Uh, specific surface area, that is the ratio of uh, how much surface area an object has relative to, if you're looking from above, um, its area. It, it's akin to porosity where Clay has a very high specific surface area because it, it has a, uh, a lot of really small particles, each of which has to be, become wet before the water can move through the clay. And some materials have an affinity for water. Um, and an example of that is glass. Um, we've seen in fluid mechanics experiments that were showing the surface tension attraction between glass and water. and so. Some materials repel water, and that's why maybe you've put Rain-X on your, wind your windshield before on the car. Rain-X is just like a very uh, volatile wax that you, you wipe onto the, the glass windscreen of your car, and then it makes water beat up and run off very easily. And so uh, if for some reason a watershed was coated in Rain-X, then that would really reduce the amount of uh, abstractions, increase the runoff. Um, so, like I mentioned, where we're headed is talking about modeling, trying to find different ways of estimating what the peak runoff is. And so that's important because how much water gets into the river depends on how much water can be, results in how much water can be used for industrial and domestic consumption. Um, it has to do with predicting floods. And it also has effects on water quality. And there's actually the Ohio River that we drink from, you may notice that its flavor changes over time. Um, it, it doesn't taste great. 
the water here. But when it tastes really bad is when it's been raining a lot. Um, except for in the spring, sometimes the water company will um, use granular activated carbon. They'll actually sprinkle powdered carbonated, uh, powdered uh, like charcoal for, it's more sophisticated than charcoal, but it's activated carbon has an affinity for organic chemicals like um, fertilizers and um, pesticides. And so in the spring when it's been really rainy, and it's also in the spring that a lot of uh, farmers are uh, adding chemicals to their fields in order to encourage plant growth, a lot of those pesticides get into the river and so the water company has to add this activated carbon or filter it through uh, carbon filters to try and remove some of the chemicals like atrazine. And, um, so how much runoff there is, if there's a lot, like a flash of runoff, then a lot of the uh, fertilizer and pesticides get into the river more easily. And so it has effects on water quality for those reasons and also just because there's a lot more turbidity. And um, when there's heavy flow, it's moving soil and sediment downstream in greater quantities and that also has to be removed before it can be consumed by people. Um, here's a hydrograph. This is a graph again of rainfall versus time. And so this is showing over the course of a certain number of days um, what the rainfall was. And if we look at the size of each one of these, it looks like that's maybe in two-hour increments, that rainfall. And then it's showing the runoff hydrograph that happened as a result of that storm. Um, the runoff continued long after the rain stopped. There was no more rain after the 19th, but the, uh, the leg of that runoff hydrograph continues to taper downward for many days after the original storm. So we would like to generate hydrographs like this. That's our objective in hydrologic modeling. Um, and this is a lot more sophisticated of a hydrograph than the hydrograph that we get from the rational method. Remember, the, the rational method only gives us a triangular hydrograph. It assumes that the water goes up to, the, the runoff goes up to some peak where here's the flow rate Q and this is time. Q equals CIA just gives us a hydrograph that looks like a triangle and it overestimates the peak flow rate and is not really realistic to how a watershed behaves. And so there are other methods that we can use that will give us a more realistic looking hydrograph shape. Um, and what that hydrograph looks like depends on um, not only the precipitation and how quickly it arrives, but a lot of different characteristics of the watershed. Um, for example, you'll notice in this diagram, it's showing that there's a lot of little streams. And so there's a very high stream density. If you have a high stream density, what that means is it doesn't take very long for water to flow over the surface before it finds a stream. And then it can, it can travel much more quickly through a stream than it can travel over the surface. Uh, surface flow is slow, but stream flow is fast. And so a highly dendritic with a network with lots of different uh, small streams is going to drain more quickly and result in a faster time to peak than one that isn't. So this is a diagram that's showing the water flowing over the surface, which is slow. And then when it reaches a flow channel, the water is able to speed up and this is showing that the channel gets wider, meaning that there's more water in the channel as you go downstream because there's a larger contributing area. At this point, the channel is very small because there's very little area running into it. But by the time you get down here, it's wide because you had all the surface runoff upstream of it contributing to how much flow there is. There are a couple of different typical shapes. If you look at them from above, if you're flying over an area um, and looking at where the streams are, this is showing a dendritic network. There are some places where because of the, the rock that's underneath the watershed and where fault lines are, you can see a pattern in the streams that's more ren uh, rectangular. And this dendritic is kind of just a, a random erosion of the surface and the rectangular isn't random. It's, there's erosion and streams are forming as a result of fault lines. And so there are some consistent trends. 
where you'll see much more straight channels in a rectangular network than there's really no straight channels in a dendritic network. Not for very long, anyway. Um, in a trellis-type pattern, the reason why there would be these lines is not because of a fault line, but it would be because of the soil that is in a certain location, and it erodes more easily in one direction than it does in another. It might be that uh, what we're looking at here, this would be a, a ridge line. This is the high point of the, the map, and the low point is where the streams are. So we know that this, here's a high point. This is a ridge line that's defining a boundary between two different watersheds. And so for some reason, there maybe is rock in this location, but there's something that is resisting erosion more than down here where the stream formed at the bottom of our watershed. And here's an example of what a trellis looks like on a coastal plain. Stream ordering is just looking at how much area is upstream of a certain location and whether a stream is accepting flow from other streams that are above it. So every place there's a one on this diagram, that means it's a first order stream and that all of the water coming into a first order stream is coming only from surface runoff. It's not coming from a different stream. And so where number two is found is where two first order streams come together. So finally, in a second order stream, it's re receiving some surface flow. So it, it does have all of the, the flow that's coming from a, areas adjacent to that number two is getting into the second order stream. But it also has an upstream network where there was a, uh, a branch. Uh, the third order stream, you can see, is where two second order streams come together, and so on. Um, so it, it's, not, it's not where there's uh, just any other stream coming together. It has to be two second order streams that form a third order stream. It has to be two third order streams that forms a fourth order stream, and so on. Yeah? <laughs> uh, it would be very high if it did. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I guess we could say it's a six or higher on the scale. Yeah, I think that. Uh, you could take it on to some sort of an extreme, but it's as high as they get. Another way to classify stream besides its order is how often water is flowing through it. Some streams don't have flow in them unless it's been raining recently, and that's an ephemeral stream. An ephemeral stream only flows once in a while if it's uh, immediately after a storm. Do you remember that video we watched of the flash flood in Arizona? That's an ephemeral stream. Um, and in fact, a, a very infrequent ephemeral stream for that location. Intermittent streams maybe will flow half the time. And a lot of the streams around here are kind of intermittent streams. The stream that runs along the road that I drive to work on, it's full of water about half the time. It, it doesn't have to be within just 24 hours of a storm. It, if it's been rainy, it will run for maybe three or four days that being an intermittent stream. And then a perennial stream always has water in it. It's got a well-defined channel and so on. Here are a couple of pictures that show the difference between a perennial stream, an intermittent stream, and one that's ephemeral. Anybody know where that is? It looks like Alaska. That's actually Utah. No, that's not me. Uh, outside Provo. That's actually the Provo River is considered one of the best fly fishing rivers in, Amer in North America. I never did any fly fishing when I was there, but it's considered a really good one. Yeah. Uh, here is showing how when it's been dry, the stream network in a watershed is very short. And when it's been wet, the stream network is long. And this is an important concept to understand. Um, and it goes to some of the stream is going to be intermittent, some of it is going to be ephemeral, and some of it will be perennial. Even within one watershed, you can have all three kinds of streams. And so um, here is the main channel. And the main channel 
has water in it even when it's been dry. It still is flowing. But when it's wet, the, uh, that channel extends its reach. And here in uh, the gray shaded areas are locations where there's seepage. And that means that the water is flowing from the ground into the channel. And so you can see that the seepage locations are much larger when it's been raining recently. And so the stream network, the location of where water is actually flowing changes depending on the weather conditions. And that, that should make sense. We're almost out of time, so I just want to show you um, how the watershed size affects what a uh, hydrograph will look like. And right now I have some stream gauges out in the field and I'm seeing this very same effect where I've got a stream gauge on a 189 acre watershed and I also have a stream gauge set up in a watershed that's about 15 acres. And the 15 acre watershed is very flashy. Um, when it rains, it, when it rains like this, you'll see a direct response to the rainfall event. And between rainfall events, how you see it was rainy here and here, the rain, you know, the, the flow rate goes down a bit and then it comes up again very quickly when it rains. And that's for a small watershed. For a large watershed, now this area that's circled, this larger circle, it sort of attenuates the uh, hydrograph. The peaks aren't as high and in fact, it takes longer to drain the watershed, and so this is going to be sloped more gradually towards zero over a longer period of time. And if you have a much larger watershed area, then you may not even see the different impact of uh, individual events. The Ohio River, for example, if you go down to Harris Riverfront Park, if it rains today, maybe the, the river level will go up a little bit, not much. But then if you go over to Ritter Park, there's a stream alongside Ritter Park, and that water level fluctuates really a lot, depending on just a single day's rainstorm. So a small watershed area, you're going to have a more uh, extreme response with the uh, runoff hydrograph than a large watershed area where the travel times are longer, there's more attenuation and routing, and so that has a big impact. Uh, that is it for our time today. Let's just take one last look at these announcements. I guess there's really no reason to because you don't have any homework due in the near future. But that's reassuring to hear, right? That uh, your next assignment, you'll get it on Tuesday and then it'll be due the following Tuesday. So, have a great day.